sure we are at 40 plus people here today. That is wonderful. Thanks so much for making the time. I'm going to move on to the next slide so we can start off with some intros and a few folks will probably continue to join in the next few minutes. So hello and welcome. This is the ROAR community meeting of 2024 and a celebration of ROAR's fifth anniversary. So as we wait for a few more people to join, feel free to head on over to the chat in Zoom and introduce yourself, say hi, uh, say your name. If for some reason your name is showing up in Zoom as Amanda French, that's just a little trick that Zoom is playing on us. So you can introduce yourself under a different name and rename yourself in Zoom and share who you are and where you're joining from in the world today. And if you'd like to share any memories of when you first heard about Roar, even if today is the first time, please go ahead and share. So thanks so much. If you're just joining right now, we are doing some introductions in the Zoom chat. So head on over there to say hello. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. And I'm excited to see where everyone is joining from today. Got some folks in the US, from across the US joining today. We've got Oxford in the house. And if you're just joining us right now, we are doing some introductions in the Zoom chat. So please feel free to head on over there and say hello. And if I'll mention just, you know, one more, one more time, we are uh, having some fun with Zoom this morning. It has decided to rename some of our participants to Amanda French, our esteemed colleague. So if you are one of the lucky Amanda Frenches out there who's not the real Amanda French, feel free to rename yourself. But it looks like we are getting folks actual names coming in. So that's wonderful. And if you've just joined us, please head on over and say hello and chat and any early memories you may have of Roar. We've got the UK, we've got Hungary, we've got some newer faces and names and some longtime Roar friends and family. So we're about five minutes past. Please feel free to continue hanging out in the Zoom chat. And I'm going to go ahead and kick off the agenda. So I'll introduce myself first. My name is Maria Gould. I am the director of ROAR. I'm joined here on this call today with three of my colleagues from the ROAR core team, who you will hear about in the course of the session. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our annual community meeting and fifth anniversary celebration of the research organization registry. So our plan for today is to really mark this milestone of ROAR reaching five years and reflect a little bit on the work that all of you across the community have done to help Roar reach this milestone. We'll share some details of what we've been working on at Roar and the work that's coming up in the years ahead. And as part of that, we'll be eager to ask for your ideas and input about what the next five years and beyond may look like for Roar. So we're just happy to welcome you all to celebrating Roar more <laughs> and more Roar in 2024 and excited to take you on a little tour of Roar past, present, and future today. A couple of quick housekeeping items. 
The session today is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube and also emailed to everyone who registered for this session. We are doing as part of this anniversary five sessions to celebrate ROAR and talk about different aspects of what's going on with the initiative. So if you go on over to roar.org slash events, there's a bunch of other sessions that you can sign up for, including one right after this one. So we need to be mindful of time today. And if you are one of the folks here on the call today who is a newer face in, in the crowd or in the pride and are interested in learning a bit more about ROAR, there's a bunch of information on the ROAR website that we invite you to check out and please Get in touch with us afterwards if you'd like a little bit more detail about what's going on with ROAR in general. So again, welcome to all of you and thanks for being here. So every year, uh, we at the end of January, we hold an open community meeting to celebrate the time when ROAR first launched and really reflect on where we've been and discuss where we're going next. This year marks a special anniversary because it marks five years, and so it's an even more meaningful moment to recognize why, what has happened over the past five years and think ahead to the future. So that's what brings us here today. And just wanted to reflect a little bit on Roar history. Uh, a lot of it kind of has to do with this image of the lopsided stool that you see. Uh, the idea behind Roar came about around 2016, probably you know, earlier than that, even uh, with a broad community effort and movement to develop a persistent identifier for research organizations and fill a crucial gap in the research infrastructure landscape. You know, at the time, we had DOIs for articles and data sets and other outputs, and we had ORCID IDs for people and other contributors in research activities, but we were really missing a third leg of, of this wobbly stool. And that was the ability to identify the organizations associated with these people and these outputs. And there were, at the time, some existing solutions already, but they didn't quite meet the needs that this broad community group had identified. And that was because either they were in proprietary databases that couldn't be distributed openly across various uh, metadata channels or because their scope was too broad or too narrow or not quite the right fit to really identify the organizations involved in research activities. And so that really led to several years of community meetings and consultations. That idea eventually led to what became named ROAR, the Research Organization Registry, and a pilot group stepped up to launch the registry with seed data from the grid database operated by Digital Science. So huge thanks to Digital Science for helping ROAR to get a major jump start in building the registry. I'm glossing over a lot of the details of the history just for the sake of time, but there is a very full and detailed timeline on the ROAR website if you ever want to read more about it. And there are many of us out there in the community, uh, including many of you on the call today who were part of those early days who I'm sure would love to share some memories and reflections of that time. So after this idea became ROAR and we started building the registry from GRID, we officially announced and revealed ROAR for the first time at a community meeting in Dublin, uh, just before Pitapalooza in January 2019. So uh, if you were there in the room, uh, maybe in these photos here in the slide, add an emoji reaction just to, uh, just to intro, uh, you know, celebrate yourself. And uh, right after that community meeting, we followed up the launch with some sessions at Pitapalooza proper uh, in, in Dublin in 2019. And if you're seeing yourself in the picture on the slide right now, uh, some of you might be here, uh, throw an emoji reaction on, on your Zoom profile as well. So those are just a little bit of you know, reflections of some of the excitement and, and energy that came around the launch of Roar. Uh, thanks to all of you who helped make that happen. And now fast forward five years later, it's 2024. And one of the things I'm reflecting on is that Roar is really operating on the same 
principles and objectives that originally propelled it many years ago. And that is to be an open and community-driven solution for identifying research organizations and enabling connections across research infrastructure to make it easier to track research outputs and activities. And we have grown the registry over the years. We have developed tools uh, to support various uses and integrations of the registry. We have formalized a sustainability and operating model with support from our three governing organizations. And we have really grown the Roar community, or, and you have grown the Roar community rather, and really developed Roar as a recommended and trusted solution for all kinds of for all kinds of use cases and needs. And so we have made a lot of progress over these years, but the core principles and core mission really remained the same as it was five years ago. So looking ahead, and you'll hear a little bit more about this from my colleagues, our key areas of focus in the coming years are really going to be driving even more of this adoption and community engagement, making sure that the registry data continues to be as good and as comprehensive as it can be for everyone who depends upon it, and unscaling our technical infrastructure to support the growing uses of ROAR across the world. And so, You'll hear more about that in a moment. So to bring my brief reflections to a close, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge, again, the people and organizations and communities that are playing a key role in ROAR today and that have been a huge part of ROAR's development and growth over the past five years and even before that. So a quick acknowledgement, first of all, to my colleagues on the ROAR team, who you'll hear from shortly, Amanda French, Adam Buttrick, and Liz Krisnarich, uh, plus a note of gratitude and thanks to members of our three operating organizations who are involved now and have been involved in the past in various aspects of ROAR, from supporting all kinds of outreach and communications efforts to coordinating our finances and everything in between. So huge thanks to all of you and everyone else uh, who was accidentally named Amanda French when you joined the Zoom call today. <laughs> and I'd also like to recognize the ROAR steering group, past and present, which has provided and continues to provide key advisory input on ROAR's strategic directions, and who have been representing a range of organization types and regions and use cases around the world. Another group I want to recognize is our Curation Advisory Board, which has been instrumental in setting the policies and approaches for our community-driven curation model and has helped to establish our comprehensive metadata practices to make our registry data as good and as useful as it can be. And I want to express my gratitude as well to our contributing supporters who have helped to augment our core base of funding from our operating organizations. And some of these organizations began contributing to and supporting ROAR all the way back in 2019. Others are newer contributors through ROAR's selection in the SCOS infrastructure funding campaign that began last year. So thank you so much. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge all of you here on Zoom today and all of you who may be listening to this recording afterwards and everyone else as well, because we wouldn't be here without all of you. ROAR is fundamentally a community-driven initiative. This is something that we are developing with, by, and for the community, and it is all of your engagement and support that has helped us reach this milestone, whether that has been you adopting ROAR, building integrations, submitting requests to add and update changes to registry data, submitting feature requests and bug reports, talking about ROAR to your friends and colleagues and family, all of that uh, is, is huge and has really been a key part of us uh, reaching this moment today. This photo is from a ROAR workshop that we did at the FORCE conference in Edinburgh in 2019. Uh, I don't know if any of you on the call were in that room today, but please add an emoji if you were there. Um, and uh, on the topic of the ROAR community, I'm going to turn it over to the real Amanda French, our technical community manager, to share more about why and how ROAR is being used to address 
a range of use cases. So take it away, Amanda. You are muted. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've, this has been kind of a, a, a big year for raw adoption. When I say this, I mean 2023, but I think we're looking forward to an even bigger year in 2024. And I'm not just saying that, I legitimately think that that's going to be true. Um, so I just wanted to give you a really brief overview of some of the adoption activity that we're seeing with Roar. Next slide. So I wanted to start by looking back to Dryad, which was the very first Roar adopter in terms of systems. Uh, so back in 2019, um, Dryad was one of the first, uh, very, very much at the same time as Datasite added support for Roar to its metadata schema. Uh, Dryad being one of the major contributors to Datasite records, registration, registrar, um, registering DOIs with Datasite um, said, well, we're going to take this opportunity as we're rebuilding the whole project uh, to incorporate Roar. So this is a little GIF that uh, Maria and Daniela put together showing um, the Roar integration in Dryad. You can see that Roar is powering a lookup in the institutional affiliation where you can type the acronym for Queens University Belfast and get um, a standardized name for that institution. Um, if you click. And this is what Roar looks like today in Dryad. Not that you can see Roar, it's there behind the scenes powering this uh, standardization of names, but you can still just type QUB and get Queens University Belfast, but Dryad developers have made enhancements to this so that now when you type in that acronym, you can actually see the acronym in the suggestions as well as the location of Queens University Belfast, which may help the user to identify whether that's the correct institution. And even more excitingly, Dryad is again in the forefront of Roar adoption in that it's one of the first systems to uh, begin using Roar to identify funders. So now there's also a Roar powered lookup um, for funding organizations. So that if you, for instance, have received funding from the Irish Research Council, um, a Roar lookup will let you add that as a standard institution. Um, so congrats to Dryad. Um, we think you are a, a wonderful example of what you can do with Roar adoption and not just adoption, but enhancing um, your Roar integration over the years instead of just um, doing it once and letting it sit there. So congrats to Dryad. Uh, next slide. Um, here's just a very uh, short list of some of the systems that are using Roar today. Uh, as I said, Dryad was one of the first adopters in 2019. There's a wonderful blog post about that. There are many demos about that. But in the last five years, we've seen more and more systems adopting Roar. And of course, major infrastructural systems, including those run by our governing organizations, uh, publishing systems, repository systems, and um, this category called other, which includes large scale knowledge graphs like OpenAlex, Lens, Semantic Scholar, which includes some funding systems, including um, national funding systems. Uh, CRIS systems are not maybe all that well represented in here. Lots and lots of sort of tracking and monitoring and statistics systems have adopted Roar and not all of those are represented here. Um, but I think some of the, the major integrations that we've seen this year um, have to do with repositories in particular. As I said, um, Dryad make some major enhancements. Um, Zenodo migrated to a new platform called Invenio RDM, which has Roar natively built in for both contributor affiliations and funder identifiers. Um, if you stick around after this call uh, and join on another Zoom link, the Community Showcase, you'll hear co-chairs of the Generalist uh, Repository Ecosystem Initiative Roar Implementation Task Group uh, talk about integrating Roar in seven of the generalist repositories that NIH recommends uh, researchers deposit data sets in. So we'll hear from, uh, these are sort of relatively new integrations that you'll hear about for the first time, including uh, Roar in Mendeley Data. Um, we'll also hear about Roar in DSpace Chris, which again is a quite a new uh, implementation. Uh, and from all kinds of other things, we'll hear um, from Springer Nature, which is a very exciting thing. We've been working with them. This is gonna be the first public announcement of their uh, use of Roar. Um, so that's gonna be very exciting. And then I'll just mention too, um, I think one of the other big 
um, at least announcements this year was from OJS, Open Journal Systems. So OJS has had Aurora plugin for quite a while. And then they released 3.4 earlier in 2023. And in that they're using Roar to manage institutional subscription statistics and just sort of generally have built in an institutional model. And this year they announced that the next major version of OJS will have Roar built right into the core code. And given that OJS is such a widely used system, I would think that's a really big adoption. Um, you'll also hear from ORCID in the upcoming community showcase. Um, there's been lots of big news with Roar and ORCID this year. Um, so if you want to hear about that, please join us for the next session. Next slide. Um, so these are all rather small <laughs> uh, graphs and charts, but uh, they all say pretty much the same thing, which is that Roar adoption is increasing in, uh, as shown in both CrossRef and data site metadata. Um, if you want to hear more about these kinds of uh, statistics, you can always join us at our upcoming bi-monthly community calls. I tend to go into more depth about those there. But I'll just give you a quick uh, rundown here. Um, there are over 1.48 million DOIs registered with data site that use Roar IDs to identify cre creator or contributor affiliations. 81% of all uh, affiliation identifiers in data site records are Roar IDs. There are over 395,000 DOIs registered with data site that use Roar IDs to identify funders in funding references. So it's a huge number. And a lot of that comes from a single adopter who uh, began using Roar IDs to identify funders. Um, so that's great. So already, even before we've made um, the move to Roar becoming um, the standard funder identifier, already 29% of funder identifiers in data site are Roar IDs. And then finally, um, Crossref uh, um, added support for Roar in its schema um, in early 2022, and there are over 81,000 DOIs registered with Crossref that use Roar IDs to identify contributor affiliations. And then uh, in that upper right, there's a little chart there um, looking at item types. Again, we had a major adopter of Roar, which was Europe PMC registering grants on behalf of the Wellcome Foundation and using Roar IDs in those. So for a long time, um, the biggest item type that was using Roar IDs was grants. But if you see that red line in the upper right, journal articles have been overtaking that as, a, as an item type, which just shows the increase in publisher adoption and publisher use, publisher use of Roar. Um, so those are just some stats. And then I just wanted to mention too, that very recently data site announced the release of schema 4.5. So in the future, we'll be able to track Roar IDs in the publisher element, Roar IDs used to identify publishers. Looking forward to that. Next slide. Uh, just quickly, some big picture developments. Uh, this is Roar's time. This is open metadata's time. This is persistent identifier time. I mean, just uh, announcement after announcement really shows that, especially in the last year, year and a half, two years. We've seen national research guidelines and policies and strategies issued in the last three years begin to call explicitly for the use of open persistent identifiers in research systems. We're seeing more and more systems and workflows make a public commitment to using and sharing open metadata. Just this morning, Leiden Metrics released for the first time an open version of its influential university rankings that relies heavily on Roar and on systems that use Roar and on other open metadata providers. And it said in its announcement that open data enables research organizations to check the quality of the data and to contribute to the data curation process by reporting data quality problems to the relevant actors. All actors in the system can contribute by working together with Roar to make improvements to the registry. So Adam will talk to you about that just momentarily. We welcome that. We think that's a wonderful development. Um, and we're very proud that Roar can fill this uh, extremely essential niche of open metadata that supports these systems. Um, if Roar didn't exist now, someone would have to begin inventing it. But fortunately, there's no need for that. Next slide. I will turn it over to Adam to talk about Roar curation. Thanks, Amanda. That's a really great note to pick up on. Uh, yeah, Adam Butchert, Metadata Curation Lead for Roar here to talk briefly about Roar curation, past, present, and future. Uh, next slide, please. So while Roar's independent curation only began about two years ago, it's really challenging in the most absolutely positive sense of the term to list all the milestones that we've hit along the way. Um, since Roar's Curation Board was founded through the hard work of policy and infrastructure building, 
across 40 releases, I reel at that number, uh, through service transitions and surprising developments, the entire scope of work and investment uh, from Roar's community has just been so generous and unfailing and impressive. In terms of pure numbers, we've updated over 20% of the registry and added close to 6,000 new records, improving coverage and quality in almost every single country. So that's just, it's just really incredible. Uh, next slide, please. And this is really true. Uh, every day we receive requests from universities, governments, laboratories, funders, myriad other research organizations from around the world. Um, the ROAR team knows this, but each day doing ROAR curation is a little bit of an adventure where we learn about how some organization has changed, been born, merged with others, formed new relationships, how we at ROAR can be better, do more, and make all the hard work that people do uh, more visible and equitably represented in particular. And, you know, these adventures, this engagement from everyone involved shows absolutely no signs of stopping. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see here, the trend driven by community contributions and our own data improvement efforts is towards processing over a thousand issues a month, which is crazy. Um, thanks to support from our community though, in all the various forms of contribution that Maria highlighted, we've been able to rise up and meet this demand, employing some you know, fantastic contract staff to help us with special projects and new forms of automation to expedite the entire curation workflow. Yeah, it's a crazy chart, I know. The line just keeps going up, up, up. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so for 2024, we're being no less ambitious. You know, that's the kind of our motto at Roar. Uh, Scheme version 2.0 will allow us to do language tagging for name metadata across the entire data set, uh, support organizations with multiple locations, and index things like organizational domains. For our project work, we will continue our reconciliation of the funder registry, improving on our already high coverage of funder ID assertions. I think we're at about 95 and 97% in Crossref and Data Site, uh, respectively. Uh, we will also further improve our coverage of ISNI and Wikidata IDs to better support services who use these values as bridge identifiers, uh, such as how ISNI is used in ORCID. In terms of project work, we will continue our efforts on records in Europe that are driving the exciting developments in open science, Amanda mentioned. Work is also already underway to improve our coverage of US government organizations, support regional initiatives in places like Latin America, improve records in China and Japan, just to name a few of the things that we're doing. So it's been an incredible journey. Uh, I'm going to hand things back over to Liz to discuss tech developments, but let me again just once, you know, express my sincere thanks to everyone who works with me uh, each day to make curating more possible. Um, truly, I, I really appreciate it. And I thank you all. All right. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm Liz Krasnarich. I'm the technical lead for Roar, and I'm here to give you a little overview of all the history um, of Roar from a technical perspective, as well as what we worked on in 2023 and what is coming up. All right, so Adam's story began sort of around 2021, but the technical history of Roar extends back a little further than that. Um, the first release of the API and data dump was back when uh, at Roar's official launch party in Dublin in 2019. Um, it was initially written in Ruby, if anyone uh, wants that dirty detail. Um, 2020, it was rewritten in Python, kind of 2019, 2020, and I should... Uh, shout out a few uh, colleagues, some of whom are here, some not. Um, so I wasn't uh, directly working hands-on on Roar at the time. Um, the initial uh, development was done primarily by Martin Fenner from Datasite and um, Dominica, uh, Dominica Tachik from Crossref worked on some features and other people were involved at that time as well. Uh, but 2019 and 2020 were those days when we were still reliant on grid for curation. Um, so we could uh, return records in the, the search interface and the API, but anytime a change had to be made or a new record had to be added, that had to be coordinated with grid. And so in 2021, we had a big technological revolution at ROAR. Um, uh, Aisha Dada, who's I think on this call from Crossref, 
uh, helped to usher in that or really led the uh, ushering in of that technical technological revolution. It was when we implemented the um, both the software, the code changes, um, as well as sort of the technical workflow and curation workflow to allow independent curation. Um, and that's when Adam came on board and we really started uh, ramping up uh, in the curation department and it's sort of you know our launching point for for where we are today. That's also when Roar got its first de dedicated developer and technical lead, which is uh, which is me. Um, in 2022, uh, we started building on the existing Roar data model a little bit by uh, acknowledging that organizations aren't all currently active in their work. Um, so we added uh, more statuses for organizations. So we have a little status field that indicates whether an organization is currently operating. At the outset, every organization in Roar was active and we didn't have a way to communicate uh, whether they weren't active. So sounds like kind of a small change, but in reality, uh, it was a pretty significant change for Roar and opened up some new opportunities. Um, kind of building on that idea of changing the data model, we knew we would, uh, based on community feedback and our own internal needs, that we would need to change the Roar data model a little bit more, which was inherited from Grid. So we started creating a versioning policy um, as well as a product development process uh, to sort of formalize our, uh, our, our ways of working internally, but also to formalize our uh, sort of agreement with the community about what we would and wouldn't do uh, and on what time scale we would make changes to the API and the schema. Um, so you can move ahead to the next slide, but I will say in that uh, in that period of time, we really didn't start measuring uh, API usage regularly until about 2021. But at that time, we were around 1 million API requests per month. Um, and since then, we hit a high last year of about 27 million API requests per month. It's leveled out slightly as people people make changes, and we have peaks and uh, peaks and valleys. But we're you know between 15 and 20 million API requests per month. So we've seen huge, huge growth in that time. Um, last year, we worked on a number of different uh, features and maintenance. Um, and new initiatives. Um, so by popular demand, we added a CSV version to our data dumps, um, which we now include as a standard part of all of our data dumps. Um, so speaking of huge increase in API requests, we made some infrastructure updates that added um, scalability and redundancy to ensure that we could continue to meet uh, the needs in the future. We've actually not ever had any significant uh, downtime or really huge issues with the API, but as those uh, request numbers ticked up, uh, we knew we needed to to grow and scale to continue to support that use. Um, we also, uh, following the versioning policy development, undertook uh, actually developing a new schema version. Um, so throughout a good chunk of 2023, we uh, released a draft version for public comment. Um, we had lots of input from the Roar community, which was really important and, and great to ensure that the changes that we're making really are serving uh, community needs and that anyone who wants to can have a voice in that process. So we went through several more rounds of revision to arrive at a finalized schema version two plan, and we uh, implemented it this past year and released um, released a beta test version of the schema version two um, in the fall. And that code is actually kind of chilling, sitting on the back burner, ready to release, but we have a little bit more work in 2024 before we can uh, officially release that publicly. So that is the, the topic that's at top of mind for Q1 of this year. Um, so one of the uh, goals that we need to meet in order to publicly release version two in our in our API is to uh, revise our curation tooling a little bit um, to support the work that Adam's doing, make it a bit more efficient, and also allow us to uh, create new records in that new version two and update 
records in that version as well. So that's the work that uh, we're doing right now. And then we plan to release the version two uh, API in production publicly by the end of uh, Q1 this year. But don't panic, we will continue to support uh, version one for at least another year. We'll be running those uh, side by side for at least a, a year. So you'll still be able to use the version one uh, API and we'll still continue to produce the version one API uh, data dumps for at least the next year. A couple of other projects that we plan to work on this year are um, looking at credentialing for our API, which is another thing don't panic about it yet. Um, what we are looking at is um, some better insight into usage patterns and who's using our API to help us efficiently uh, run services and particularly to contact users in case of technical issues. So we're not trying to prevent people from using the API at all. Um, and uh, uncredentialed access will remain available, but we want to be able to uh, contact folks when we notice patterns, you know, your your requests are generating consistent errors all day, every day. We want to help you to um, to improve your um, your use of the API, but also improve it so that uh, so that the Aurora API as a community, a shared community service, continues to run efficiently. Um, in terms of features and services, uh, we have been looking at redesigning the affiliation matching service for a while. And in fact, um, over in Crossref Labs, Adam and Dominica have been um, testing out new approaches and we are looking forward to hopefully implementing um, a redesigned affiliation matching service with the goal of improving um, accuracy in the results returns as well as improving performance. So that is it for me and I will hand it back to to me, uh, Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Amanda. And again, thanks to all of you here on the call and elsewhere. I think the themes that have been coming through in the reviews that Adam and Amanda and Liz just went over is that all of this work has happened and is continuing to happen because of how the community is using ROAR and giving input on current and future developments. This truly is a collaborative initiative and will continue to be. And so we really depend on your continued input and engagement to accomplish all of these goals and more. So Another theme that I just wanted to reflect upon before I ask for some more ideas and input is, you know, I'm I'm struck by, you know, by this, you know, this theme about ROAR being infrastructure for other infrastructure. Everything that we are developing at ROAR is not for ROAR to exist in a silo, but it's really to be able to feed all of these other infrastructure initiatives that are out there to make it easier to understand and track information about research and research activities around the world. And so in that sense, it is also a very collaborative effort by nature. So as we think ahead to where ROAR is going and where the overall landscape and, and community is going, we saw some interesting developments in Amanda's slide. We wanted to ask for some of your ideas and reflections about, about what that means for, for the future of ROAR. So I'm going to set this up as a mentee poll. We hope that it will work with the number of participants that are here today. So the way that you can participate is either to go to mentee.com in your browser or on your phone and enter the code that you see on the slide. Or if you have a smartphone handy, you can point it at the QR code to set it up. So I'll give you all a chance to do that. And we just have 
uh, a couple, two quick questions and then a kind of open-ended question to reflect upon. So it will only take a few minutes or so, but we're interested to hear from all of you. If you don't feel like engaging with Menti, you're also welcome to share anything you'd like in the Zoom chat. So again, menti.com and enter the code or access it from the QR code with your phone. And I'm going to switch tabs and hope that we are seeing these results come through. So I'll give a few minutes for the first question, which is just asking all of you to think about what is the biggest opportunity for ROAR in 2024? Definitely seeing a theme of funder registry, transition and funder IDs. On that note, I'd encourage everyone to come to our session tomorrow about funding metadata. You can register at roar.org slash events. Seeing a lot of themes about publisher integrations. few more seconds for this first question. I like all of these opportunities. All right, let's move on to the next question, which is kind of similar along the same lines. So the next question is, what do you see as the most important goal for ROAR in the next five years? And it could be something you said on the previous slide. It could be something else, thinking kind of further ahead. Right, seeing some a theme of coverage here, which is definitely very important. Affiliation matching, publisher integrations, extensibility, becoming the unquestioned standard. I like that one. Interoperability is going to be key. So a few more, another minute or so for uh, this question. Transition to the new schema version, that's gonna happen well, I, if that if that idea is about V2, that will happen in the next couple of months. <laughs> we'll see what happens after that. Looking at scope, curation. All right, last call for your ideas about the next five years. I like the suggestion of demonstrating more use cases. Definitely we'll be working on that. Okay, so 
Thank you for all of these. I'm going to move to the next one and last one, which is a little bit more open-ended. And this is just asking if there's anything else you want to say or share about ROAR. And if there's anything else that we haven't touched on today or anything you wanted to mention about what ROAR means to you, this is your opportunity. And you can also mention things in the Zoom chat as well. And if there's, yeah, if there's nothing specific, you can also just wish Roar a happy birthday or uh, <laughs> any special requests. I'm like, so excited uh, about swag. That probably more, is my job. Swag. <laughs> I, I'm so on board with that. Mm -hmm. I, if, if the people are asking for it, then I am, I am answering. <laughs> In this virtual environment, it gets easy to overlook, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm all about the Roar swag. Yep. Been there, got the persistent identifier, got the t-shirt. Yeah. The t <laughs> um, I really like this message here to keep going. That's definitely the plan and, and the goal. And I hope all of you take that to heart as well. As you think about anything else to say here, if if anything stands out from you know from what you saw and other people's responses, uh, anything that you you know anything that you didn't see, you can also mention that. Seeing one question in chat about definitions for organization types, I know that's documented on our documentation site, so I think we can drop the link to that page in the Zoom chat to help out this person asking that question. All right, so thank you for all of these messages. Thank you for the suggestions about how to move forward. I do want to emphasize that this mentee poll is not the only way to share ideas and input with ROAR. I really invite all of you to get involved in various activities if you are not already, and there are a number of ways that you can do that. So I'm going to step away from the mentee screen and go back to my slides just to run down a few uh, a few items about ways in which we can keep in touch and in which you can keep contributing your ideas and input for the next five years and more. So we have a number of different engagement and communication channels that some of you may already be involved in. I know some of you are already involved in. Every other month we hold community calls along with other events. Those are all listed on the ROAR events page on our website. And we especially appreciate the community calls to be able to share updates on what ROAR is doing and also to give you all opportunities to give input. We know that those calls, it's not possible for everyone to join for various reasons. So we record the calls and we also make sure that if there's requests for input and other kinds of things that we don't just share those on the calls, we circulate various kinds of documents and other ways to get asynchronous feedback. We have a few different discussion channels. One is in Slack and the other is a technical forum. And we'll make sure that all of these links are shared in the Zoom chat and in the follow-up email. So that's another great way to ask questions. You can also email us directly if you have a specific question. As Adam talked about, the curation process for adding and updating records in the registry is very active and depends heavily on experts and users out there who have suggestions and feedback about additions and changes. So please get in touch with us if you haven't already done so about that. We are also maintaining information on GitHub about our roadmap and we really encourage ideas and input or bug reports as well if you notice something isn't working. 
We are featuring ROAR integrators on the ROAR website and in a series of case study interviews that Amanda runs. And so if you ever want to talk super in depth about the work that you're doing with ROAR, let Amanda know. And we also have a quarterly-ish newsletter that we send out that's essentially a news roundup of everything that's going on with ROAR. So these are the primary ways that you can join and be involved in ROAR if you are not already. And I, again, I just want to emphasize the importance of hearing from you about what's working, what's not working, what you want to see more or less of. All of that is really instrumental to making sure that ROAR is continuing to serve all of your needs. So on that note, I just want to thank all of you, and I want to invite you to roar some more in 2024 and to bring this all to an official close, even though we're moving to another session right after this, but this kind of includes the birthday party and anniversary celebration part of the event. Uh, I'm going to put on my special roar headdress and ask all of you to join me in celebrating roars five years and all of the years to come so if you would like you can join me in raising one arm if you are excited about roar and raising the other arm if you're still excited about roar and then dropping your elbows and making your hands into a claw and on the count of three, whether you're muted or unmuted, it doesn't matter. We're all going to do a silent or very loud roar. So one, two, three, roar. 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's hard. So That's thanks again, all of you. We will bring uh, this recording and slides to all of you afterwards. And I really appreciate everything that you have done to help us reach this milestone. And if you want even more ROAR right now, please join us for the community showcase session starting in about seven minutes.